This episode is sponsored by NordVPN. Take control of your internet today. One hundred sixty-nine years ago, on December fifteenth, eighteen fifty-four, two ingenious devices that newspapers called a most useful invention were given a public demonstration on the streets surrounding Philadelphia's Independence Square, and that is considered to be the first time in history that a mechanical street sweeping device was used in the United States. Ironically, in Philadelphia, which for a couple of decades of the twenty-first century was the only major U.S. city not to have a citywide street sweeping program. Today, mechanical sweepers, the machines alone represent a $3.6 billion annual industry, are well known throughout the world, but mechanical street sweepers are a relatively new invention that took some time to sweep a skeptical public off their feet. Wherever you go on the internet, you will find pirates, and they'll want to raid your devices and take your IP address as booty. Arr. But you can protect your internet security and keep your privates private. And that's why you should stop scammers and hackers in their tracks by logging in through NordVPN on all your devices every time. And logging in through NordVPN lets you surf safely and securely even when you're traveling anywhere in the world. In fact, you don't even have to travel. You can simply log into a NordVPN server located in another country and browse the internet as if you were based there. That might allow you to see different shows on Netflix, or see sports programs that are blocked out in your area, or even save money because the same product bought through the same e-commerce site might cost less in some countries than in others. And right now, you can get a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus additional four months free when you use my link, nordvpn.com slash thehistoryguy. The best deal on the internet is if you use my link, and it's all risk-free because of Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That is, what is it, Pocky? nordvpn.com slash thehistoryguy. It's the best deal on the internet, and it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. With people comes filth. Human waste, animal waste, and garbage are part and uh, parcel of civilization. And with filth comes the scourge of civilization, disease. A hunter-gatherer may be able to simply walk away from the trash, but once you build a coliseum, it's the trash that has to move. We know relatively little about sanitation in ancient civilization, but we do have clues. For example, you can still see remains of the Cloaca Maxima in Rome, Sewers so large that the first century B.C. Roman historian Strabo wrote that you could ride a cart loaded with hay through it. A sewer offers a means of bringing clean water to a city and washing filthy water away, but a sewer may also be used to drain areas, such as the notorious swamps around Rome, to clear land for development or limit the disease associated with swamps. But a sewer can also clean your streets. The website Engineering Rome explains, aside from removing human waste from the city with the use of latrines, the sewer system helped fight diseases. With the Cloaca Maxima and aqueducts, the Romans began flooding streets constantly to clean them out. Flooding and draining the streets played multiple roles. The removal of feces and urine, trash and general filth were all connected, as they are still today, even if the roles of the street sweeper and the garbage truck have diverged. The website of the Miami, Ohio County Solid Waste District explains, In Rome, the sewage system was also a common garbage disposal option. In fact, the body of a murdered 3rd century emperor was actually dumped into the sewer. He was neither reduced nor recycled. He simply became political refuse in more ways than one. And the Romans were clearly on to something, as the idea of washing streets via the sewer system carries on today in one of the world's largest cities. In 1853, Emperor Napoleon III hired George Eugene Hausmann as Prefect of the Seine. To Hausmann fell the role of renovating the ancient city of Paris, the subject of another episode of The History Guy. Part of the process of sweeping away the old Paris was the construction of a new sewage system, a job that Hausmann delegated to Eugene Belgrand, Director of Water and Sewers. Belgrand massively increased the size and capacity of the Paris sewer system, so much so that the Paris sewers are now a tourist attraction. But he did more than make a big sewer. He actually built two water supplies for the city. The website Parisian Fields explains that Belgrand created a high-pressure system from an underground supply that provided potable drinking water, but also a low-pressure system supplied by the river Ork. 
That untreated water, called public water, can be released through some 12,000 washing outlets, or WOs, in French, bouche de lavage, throughout the city. Parisian Fields explains, the water comes out at various places through WOs on the curbs, and after cleaning the streets and gutters, flows into the underground sewers. This water is then treated and discharged into the Seine. There is a parallel but separate system to deliver potable water to buildings, residents, homes, stores, and restaurants. Although the use of the system requires the help of sanitation workers, the Parisian men in green, the system serves to clean streets much the way that it was done in ancient Rome. There is evidence of sewer systems throughout the ancient world. The newspaper The Greek Reporter notes that the first major drainage system of Athens was built in the 5th or 6th century BC on the western side of the Agora. The Great Drain, as it was known, was built with heavy walls of polygonal-shaped stone blocks covered with stone plates to serve as a street. Although the newspaper notes that it is unclear whether the drainage was used for managing clean water or sewage, in any case, the discovery highlights a surprisingly advanced approach to plumbing used by the ancient Greeks earlier in their history. It seems quite plausible that, like Rome, the process of draining swamps and washing streets was combined. Recent archaeology suggests that collecting refuse might have come from a cultural nexus, Roman engineering, and Jewish religious beliefs. The website Imperium Romanum reports that archaeologists discovered a 2,000-year-old landfill outside of Jerusalem that appears to be the first known pit where rubbish was collected. The website writes that scientists believe that the garbage dump is a joint innovation of the effective Romans and the cleanliness of the Jews. The Miami County Solid Waste District website notes that most authorities agree humans historically would often just live with their garbage. In ancient Pompeii, for example, trash was evidently piled in cemeteries and along city walls. The website quotes University of Tel Aviv archaeologist Yuval Gadot. It looks like there was a mechanism in place that cleared the streets, cleared the houses, using donkeys to collect and throw away the garbage. Gadot speculates that this development may have occurred sooner in the Roman province of Judea because of the nature of the Jewish faith. It could be that it became a norm in Jerusalem that you have to take out the garbage because it's impure and has to be brought outside the city, Gadot suggests. It's not the municipality saying so. God says so, and that makes it easier. The suggestion of systems for sanitation challenged the assumption that ancient cities were merely festering piles of human stink. In fact, cities could not have arisen without at least a rudimentary system to keep the streets passable. Likewise, in his 2001 work, Daily Life in the Middle Ages, Professor Paul B. Newman challenges what he calls the insistent aspersion that the streets of medieval towns were consistently foul-smelling and full of filth. Although he warns against painting too rosy of a picture, he notes that cities would not have grown at the rate they did before the arrival of the Black Plague without sanitation. In terms of street cleaning, he notes that the cities and towns took several actions to fight the accumulation of garbage in their streets. Most had laws, at first customary but later written down, that required citizens to keep streets and pathways in front of their properties free from nuisance, including large or especially obnoxious trash that impeded traffic. Charters of Italian and French towns and cities from as far back as the 13th century include many examples of such regulations. Records of legal actions to enforce such laws are common and heavy fines were imposed, especially on repeat offenders. These cities also had a version of today's sanitation workers, Professor Newman continues. In addition to laws, cities also took direct action to keep streets passable and prevent dangerous health conditions by employing men to clean the streets and gutters. Called rakers in London, these street cleaners raked up trash, placed it in their carts, and hauled it away for disposal. Yet as cities grew, challenges arose. Historian Lawrence Larson wrote in a 1969 edition of the Wisconsin Magazine of History, for a variety of reasons, street sanitation and related problems of garbage collection and sewerage systems seldom loom large on 19th century urban services priority lists. Since a majority of urban dwellers tended to take dirt, slime, and foul odor for granted, officials seldom found themselves under serious pressure to undertake corrective measures. Instead, they concentrated their activities and resources on areas that seemed of greater community concern. Fire and police protection, school systems, waterworks, and gas lines. Traditional methods requiring residents to sweep their street were simply less effective. Larson writes, In the first half of the 19th century, few cities maintained paid personnel to clean streets. Responsibility rested with residents whose homes abutted on a street and with able-bodied men chosen for specific periods off the tax rolls and with contracted scavengers. The household system did not work effectively. A New Yorker reminisced about local conditions in the 1830s wrote, There was a law requiring each household, as often we believe as once a week, to sweep before his own door, not only the sidewalk, but also halfway across the street, where his opposite neighbor would meet him. The dirt swept in heaps was to be carried away by the carts. 
We well remember that the households swept as often as they pleased, and for the matter of being carried away, the dirt often remained in heaps for several days, or rather the heaps were trodden and scattered about again and required to be swept and collected anew. In fact, in the 18th and 19th centuries, a common method of street cleaning was simply to let wild pigs wander the streets. Larson notes that Francis Trollope, the English novelist and social critic who spent several months in Cincinnati in the late 1820s, said, In truth, the pigs are constantly seen during Herculean service in this way, through every quarter of the city. And though it's not agreeable to live surrounded by herds of these unsavory animals, it is well they are so numerous and so active in their capacity of scavengers, for without them the streets would soon be choked up with all sorts of substance and every stage of decomposition. Part of the growing challenge in the 19th century was the new pollution of the Industrial Age. The website of the Michael B. Stoner Company explains, The Industrial Revolution in England was not a healthy place to live, particularly in Manchester. Manchester had more textile mills than any other city in England, and those mills produced huge amounts of pollutants into the air and onto the streets. Cotton exports from the United States were brought to Manchester by the shipload, and the city became known as the workshop of the world. The mills and factories paid good wages, attracting thousands of families to move to the city or even to England to escape poverty. Add in the world's first passenger rail service to help move workers around the city, and it was not a healthy place to live. Because of the rapid growth of the city, many homes were overcrowded, didn't have running water, so waste was dumped in the streets. The death rate was high, but more people kept coming, lured by high wages. While nothing could be done about the pollution being emitted into the air, there was something that could be done about the pollution in the streets. The answer that would produce a sweeping change in how streets were cleared would come from a brilliant inventor and engineer named Joseph Whitworth. Whitworth's company manufactured high-quality machine tools, and among other inventions, he developed a more accurate rifle and a breech-loading cannon with a longer firing range. In 1843, to address the challenge of Manchester's dirty streets, he invented the patent street sweeping machine of Manchester. While his horse-driven machine didn't clean the air, it did pick up trash, and it generally seemed to be the first mechanical street sweeper. The website of British street sweeping contractor SuperSweep writes that without the wits of Joseph Whitworth, workers would have suffered long in the streets of Manchester. Whitworth's horse-drawn device used spinning brooms powered by a bicycle chain to sweep trash off the street onto a conveyor that dumped it into a cart. Another horse-drawn device with brushes was patented by American C.S. Bishop in 1849. It was those two devices that were demonstrated in Philadelphia in 1854. The demonstration was described in the Philadelphia Correspondence section of the Charleston, South Carolina Daily Courier. Among other improvements recently brought to the notice of authorities is a machine for sweeping the streets. On Saturday afternoon last, a public trial was made on the streets surrounding Independence Square of two street sweeping machines in the presence of members of the council and a number of citizens. The paper reports that the principle of the machine in one word is to scrape, sweep, and deposit either mud or dust in the body of the vehicle as it progresses. A single horse only is required to drag it, and the machine will sweep clean a street, the distance of one of our squares, in five minutes. And opines that this certainly is a most useful invention, performing as it does work more expeditiously and economically than could be done under our present contract system of cleaning the streets of our city. For the sake, then, of fair pedestrians who daily throng Chestnut Street and other fashionable promenades, I hardly wish the street-sweeping machines every imaginable success. The brush of reality, however, did not live up to the strokes of that optimistic newspaper. Larson notes that early models, consisting of a primitive revolving brush apparatus drawn by one horse, function so unreliably and cost so much that only a small number of cities even bothered to consider their purchase. So unpaved streets continue to defy all methods of systematic cleaning, although the spreading of various kinds of gravel and frequent sprinkling did hold down the dust. Despite Whitworth and Bishop's efforts, the primary method of street sweeping for growing cities in the latter part of the 19th century was, Larson writes, manpower. Larson concludes that despite vastly increased public spending and ingenious cleaning devices, street cleaning did not loom as a major accomplishment of Americans in the 19th century. More than 300 U.S. patents for improved machines, including by female inventor Eureka Brown and African-American inventor Charles Brooks, failed to clear the air. But the addition of another technology would brush away the dirty streets of the past. In 1911, inventor J.M. Murphy pitched an idea for an improved street sweeping machine to the American Tower and Tank Company of Elgin, Illinois. The difference with his machine was that instead of a horse, the new machine was motorized. 
The first unit was sold to Boise, Idaho in 1913, and it demonstrated far better reliability and economic savings over horse-drawn machines. The Elgin Sweeper was patented in 1917. Today, there are numerous different kinds and makes and models of street sweeping machines available, including ones that act like a giant vacuum cleaner, but the fact is most of them in use today are essentially giant motorized brushes, not all that different than Murphy's machine. The biggest difference since has been improvement in the brushes, so they catch much smaller particles, which has a bigger impact on water quality because it catches those particles before they go into the storm sewer system. But answers throughout the world differ. In Hong Kong, where streets are generally considered to be immaculate, they still sweep their streets entirely using men with brooms. In fact, most cities require at least a few of those uh, still today, even if they're using good street sweeping machines. But just north of there, in the city of Shenzhen, China, they are trialing new automated electric street sweepers. Just like a I don't know, giant Roomba rolling down the sidewalk. Today, street sweepers face challenges, among the most difficult being getting people to move their cars on street sweeping days, the reason that Philadelphia gave up regular street cleaning in the early 2000s, although the mayor has vowed to start the service again by the end of 2023. Washington, D.C. writes so many street sweeping tickets, 86,000 in 2017, that residents have questioned whether the city is cleaning streets or merely raising revenue from the tickets. Today, some citizens and municipalities are questioning whether street sweepers are worth it. They can be quite expensive. The cost per ton of refuse removed for a street sweeper is much more than regular garbage collection. But regulations, like the Clean Water Act, mean that it is very likely that giant street sweepers will continue to rumble down your street for the foreseeable future. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 